You're listening to The Wise Woman Podcast, Episode 9. I'm your host, Alicia Wilfert, founder of Yoke and Abundance, a creative leadership coaching business. This podcast is designed to inspire by introducing you to creative women living abundantly. I hope you'll savor Tina's words of wisdom as much as I have. I am delighted to get to introduce you to my friend, Tina Firesheets. Tina is a storyteller, writer, and journalist. When we recorded this interview back in May, she was working in communications at Guilford County Schools, but before that, she'd worked in journalism for over 25 years and was still writing the occasional freelance piece. Recently, Tina sent me a message to tell me that she'd started a new job with a local company, Pace Communications, and I was delighted to hear that she's back to writing for a magazine. Journalism is where her heart has always been and it shows. Tina and I actually met many years ago when she covered a story about a nonprofit that I helped found with a group of nine other enthusiastic youngsters looking to make a difference in Greensboro. That's the kind of journalist Tina is. And she's the kind of person you want to hang out with because she's thoughtful and truly wise. I'm looking forward to sharing this interview with you, but first a word from our sponsor. Emerge Skin Therapy is this month's sponsor. Emerge is a local business that believes in supporting other female local entrepreneurs so much that Azalea, the owner of Emerge Skin Therapy, decided to sponsor an entire month of the Wise Women podcast. I've been talking to women who love going to Emerge Skin Therapy, and it turns out someone you've already heard from on this podcast is also a big fan of Emerge Skin Therapy. Do you remember Victoria Brownlee from our first episode? She's a fan because she says, Azalea took the time to analyze my skin, to assess the root of my acne. Her patience and care made me feel comfortable when my skin was at its most vulnerable. Here recently, I've received numerous compliments about how my skin is cleared. Not only has it increased my confidence, but it's made me comfortable in my own skin. I know Victoria told me she's looking forward to future appointments, as am I. Visit EmergeSkinTherapy.com and mention the Yoke and Abundance Wise Woman podcast for 10% off your next service. Tina Firesheets. Hi, good morning. Good morning. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's so much fun. It's such a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Me too. (laughs) So if you don't mind, would you share your age with the group? I know. My son was asking me that recently, and I'm thinking, why do you want to know? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I can tell you why I want to know. I want to show a diversity of people and ages. That's fine. I will be 47 in a few months, and that sounds really old, but I feel like this dorky teenager still. I've heard 40s are like the best decade. Mm. Have you heard that? Do you feel that way? I don't know. Um, you know, I, I wish that I actually, I, what I wish is that I had my 20s just in terms of my energy and the body that I had and just the, you know, just that sense of um, enthusiasm and hopefulness, but with the wisdom uh, that I have and all the knowledge that I've acquired now. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Can you give us a little bit about your background, who you are, and what you're up to these days? So, um, oh gosh, well, so how far back do you want to go? I guess <laughs> <laughs> people usually think that I have an interesting backstory because I grew up in Western North Carolina um, on the Indian Cherokee Indian Reservation. Um, my mother was Japanese, and my father is Anglo, or was Anglo, and um, they adopted me. I'm Korean. <laughs> So, growing up, my mother was the only other Asian person that I knew until I went to college, Um, and that was different, (laughs) and um, so I ended up here at UNCG because I had a friend, a mentor, who um, spoke highly of the admissions process and how organized things were and how impressed she was with UNCG, and so I ended up here and um, thought I made a mistake. 
because I was really into journalism at the time and I thought, oh, I should have gone to Chapel Hill and I hate Greensboro because it's so hot. Why is it so hot and humid? And um, my first thought was that I was going to leave Greensboro as soon as I finished at UNCG. But I met my husband and my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer my senior year and I'm still here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now I don't hate Greensboro. I actually, <laughs> I, I love, I've come to love this area. And um, so anyway, that's <laughs> my Thank story. You. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I, I saw you at, was it a moth storytelling mm-hmm. event once? Mm-hmm. And you were talking mm-hmm. about your background and that mm-hmm. your mom being the only other Asian person you knew growing up. Mm -hmm. And you have a bit of a story around that as well, right? Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the in the eighties, and um, and when you grow up in a very rural area, most everyone, um, you know, in that area, most everyone is native, or at least some portion, you know, some part native um, or white. And um, I just wanted to assimilate. I just, you know, I had no interest in, um, I just, I just cared about boys and wanting to wear makeup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, honestly, that was my whole focus was boys and, um, and I wanted to style my hair and wear makeup and, and be attractive to boys. I was a very, you know, deep person then. <laughs> I think we all go through that at some point. <laughs> I certainly did. <laughs> so, um, so I didn't care about identity. It didn't really occur to me that, um, you know, that it was important that I know, um, you know, where I came from or, or that, um, but I, but I also was very interested in where my mom came from and, and she would tell me about, you know, being in Japan and, and being from Tokyo, which was, you know, a, a, one of the largest cities in the world. At the time, it was the largest city in the world. And, and all of the things that she used to do there and the shopping and the food and the way of life. And, and, and I think through her stories, I really wanted to not be in Western North Carolina. <laughs> I really envisioned myself being in a very large city and, and kind of um, living the sophisticated life that I imagined through her that she had. And I think that, and, and that was really influential, I, I think. I um, also realized very early in life that the outside world really thought of people who grow up, who would live in Western North Carolina as less educated, very backwards, very, um, you know, don't, all the stereotypes don't have indoor plumbing. And I didn't want to be thought of as a hick. So I, I changed the way that I spoke and I, I tried to lose my southern accent and um, and and I was really kind of trying to move toward being um, more sophisticated and um, and not of that area. Um, I even so my so my cousins would call our grandparents um, Granny and Granny and Paul. I, I forget what they called my grandfather, but I called them Grandma and Grandpa. I didn't. I wouldn't call them Granny, <laughs> my grandmother Granny, um, and so it was little things like that. So I, I guess in some ways, I've always my whole life, um, through um, high school, was was about assimilating, yeah, and and assimilating, but not assimilating. Assimilating, um, as in not um, being Asian, but um, not assimilating in that I didn't. Um, I didn't want to be considered a, a an Appalachian hick, um, so that was kind of strange. Um, and then, yeah, um, I I didn't. I, I think when I became a parent, and when I became um, when I reached my mid thirties, which was how old my mother was when she became a parent, and when she came to the U.S., um, I realized how difficult it must have been for her to go from um, living in in Japan and leaving her family and leaving her friends and everything that was familiar to her to come to us which is something that she wanted since childhood as well but you know coming to the us and and settling in an area that's very rural and very um you know there was no 
there was no there was not a place where she could go and get Asian food. There was not a place where she um, felt like you know she could go and get her hair done the right way. Um, people, it took her a while to to make friends, mm. and even when she did make friends, I don't know that she felt um, a depth of um, familiarity and 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 that that deep friendship that you that I ha- feel that I have with right. many of my girlfriends, and so when I think about um, how lonely she must have been, and my father was not. It was not the best spouse and not the best father. Um, So he was not very sensitive to um, anyone's needs, really. (laughs) But he was certainly not sensitive to, um, you know, uh, a woman's needs of, of, you know, feeling isolated and feeling alone. And and when you're having troubles with your marriage and your child and and feeling so far away, I, I understand her more. Yeah. Um, as a woman, as a mother, as, as you know, I, I um, have a great deal of sympathy and empathy for, um, for her life. Um, um, and, and I think that my father, you know, he um, was the way he was because of, you know, how things that happened to him. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, I'm curious how you think your childhood and growing up and maybe even you're ignoring your otherness, Mm -hmm. how that led you to your curiosity of journalism? Oh, Um, in a way it always leads back to boys. (laughs) 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 No, I was always, um, I always read, I was an only child, my parents, were very strict and um, I didn't go very many places and I wasn't allowed to hang out with friends very um, much so so I read a lot I read all the time and I from early on I was told that I was a good writer and so and English was always my favorite subject and and so um, somehow well and I was involved with this student newspaper, the school newspaper in high school. Um, I was not the editor or anything, but um, but I enjoyed it enough, but somehow, and I don't to this day know how that happened, but I got was given the opportunity to go to a journalism um, camp workshop for a whole week at Marshall University. And it was wow, the summer. in West Virginia. In, in West Virginia. And it was the summer after my senior year of high school. And the Asheville Citizen Times paid for my airfare. I don't know how they found out. Um, I, I certainly didn't reach out to them, but but somehow, and I, I think this must have been orchestrated by a teacher because I didn't know to seek those opportunities out at that time. So I went um, to that workshop and and really fell in love. I'd never, the kids there, the other, um, it was a diverse group. I'd never, I never met anyone who was Mexican American. <laughs> um, there were, there was like one black person in my high school. <laughs> like um, it, it just blew my mind that I was with these other um, kids my age, really, who seemed so much more sophisticated. I was completely intimidated. Um, you know, they they were headed to the black girls were headed to Howard and um, you know, there was a um uh a Latina girl who wanted to be with the Rainbow Warriors at some point and she was from Arizona and like I just had never met people like that. I'd never met people who were so smart and seemed to have it so together and um and at the, at, I just, you know, I, I felt, I just, I, I don't know that I got as much out of the experience as I would have today, maybe, because I was so intimidated. Uh. Um, but I was very grateful to be there. And, um, and, and so I learned basic, you know, journalism, Yes, I guess. Um, I, I didn't know what a lead was before then and, and how to write a new story or, or anything. And, um, and so that's my curiosity, my interest started there. And then when I went to Brevard College for my first two years of, of college, 
Um, I immediately went to um, the person who was over the student newspaper and I got involved with the student newspaper and I signed up for journalism. Then I did an internship with the Hendersonville Times News and, and, um, and loved it and spent the whole summer, I basically worked for free. They got a good deal out of me. I only <laughs> needed like, I don't know, 20 community service hours, which wow. I chose to serve at the, at the, at the paper. And um, I lived with my aunt and Arden, and I went to the newspaper every day, and just, it, I was hooked. What is it about journalism that you are so in love with? Just that um, if you have a natural sense of curiosity, you're always learning something new. You're, and, and just the storytelling. I still enjoy telling stories and, and sharing other people's stories. And um, I love that um, what I miss is that um, you get the opportunity to, to be in places and to see things that the rest of the world doesn't have access to. Mm-hmm. And it really... And there's a uh, responsibility in that too, right? Yeah. Because then you have to share what you get to see. Right, yeah. And it's pretty magical. I love talking to people who love what they do. I love talking to people who have a passion about something or who are driven by something or, um, you know, who are better people because of something. Um, you know, that part of journalism, I, I, I feel like, came with time. But... You know, initially it was it was um, I I don't like being in one place all all the time every day, and the thought of sitting at a desk um, for eight ten hours straight and only seeing you know the same things every day was stifling to me. Um, it teaches you a lot because you're having to interact with people that you um, who are very different from you, whose personal lives are very different from yours, whose perspectives are very different. Um, you may not agree at all with what they're doing. Um, you, um, it forces you to, you know, most of us in our daily lives, we are, we navigate the world and, and, and frequent places that are comfortable mm-hmm. for us. Um, you know, I am frequently the only other Asian person, <laughs> the only Asian person anywhere. So that is not unusual for me. But I don't know that, you know, in my daily life, had I not gone into journalism, what I found, I've ever found myself in a black church or a Buddhist temple or a mosque or, um, uh, you know, any of the situations that I found myself in. And, and, and I really enjoyed that. Of It teaches you so much about people and it teaches you so much about communicating with people and, and, um, and, and I think about some, you know, the, the many beautiful stories that I was honored to be able to share through my time as a, as a journalist and then also as a feature writer. And um, it was a great gift. Yeah. It was a great gift. Because you get to have these really interesting experiences in the journalism world, mm-hmm. what would you tell someone who wants to broaden their horizons but isn't in journalism what can they do you know the uh, now I'm, this is kind of a roundabout way of getting to that but but uh, i think we'll eventually get there it used to irritate me um, when people would say that greensboro is not very diverse because i see a, a great deal of diversity in greensboro um, the Vietnamese started coming here in the 70s with the Lutheran Family Services after the Vietnam War. And so that began um, a framework and a network of, um, uh, it established a framework and a network for the city to be able to, t- to, to be a refugee resettlement community. And so, you know, you had the, re- um, the Vietnamese and then you had the Bosnian Serbs and then you have, you know, Africans. And, and also a t draws a lot of um, international students from Africa and Asia and they have a very strong engineering program um, which draws students from, or yes, yeah, students and, and faculty members from elsewhere. And then you have, um, and then you have this, the, the, the companies themselves that draw an international employment base like Volvo, there's a pretty significant Swedish population here. Um, and Ivonic brings a yeah, huge German population. population. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, Greensboro is incredibly diverse. And 
Um, and if you just drive down High Point Road, you can see um, you can see the um, the different ethnic restaurants, which are quite obviously you know um, what most people are going to notice, even if they're not looking for it. But you see, um, you know, Latino hair salons and and I go to a Korean hair salon and I noticed when I, we went to the um, Mexican ice cream place um, there's a k-pop cosmetic store right next to it <laughs> you just have to open your eyes to what's around you right. and once your eyes are open to what's around you you see the many opportunities it's um, you know, it doesn't take anything, and it doesn't take very much courage. It's just a sense of curiosity to go get some ice cream at the Mexican ice cream place. Yeah, where is that? <laughs> now I want Mexican ice cream. <laughs> it's on High Point Road. I'm gonna head down central. there later. Yeah, yeah, and and, and stop in at the K-pop cosmetic store. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, just walk into the bit. I mean, I walk into. Um, I, I love food, so I, I walk into ethnic groceries and restaurants all the time and just take a look. Um, you know, just be curious. You don't have to be of that community to go into these places. And and you, if you're not used to doing that sort of thing, it might feel a little bit odd. But um, generally, the people who are there, they're... they're um, Probably maybe wondering what you're doing there, but <laughs> yeah. but they're super helpful. There's a um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So there's a a Buddhist temple in Southeast Greensboro, and I know because I wrote about it um, many years ago. I know that during the summer they have um, on the weekends a, a lot of people. I think they are Cambodian and Lao, Laotian um, go there. And um, they set up, um, they bring the things that they grow in their garden, and um, it's kind of like a little outdoor flea market. And um, they bring the things that they grow in the garden and plants, and um, a couple of people will be grilling, and you can get a plate of rice and um, papaya salad and um, steak or um, uh, Cambodian sausages for like, I, I've, at the time that I went, the first time it was like $5. It might be oh a little goodness. bit more now, but it's not very expensive. And um, it's mostly that community that's there because it's mostly, you know, who knows about it. Um, I wrote about it and I felt terrible afterward because um, I felt like I discovered this gem. It was just such a such an authentic place. You'd never know it was in Greensboro. You would feel like you were in um, Cambodia or Thailand. And um, the health department saw my story in the news and record and, and came and told them they couldn't do that anymore. Oh no! I was devastated. Um, and that's been several, some years. Um, but they started back up, right? I went, I stopped, I happened to be in that area the other day and I, I, I drove in and they're there. And I was so relieved and it made me so happy. Um, and you know, I, I felt a little bit, you know, you always feel when you're by yourself in a, in an unfamiliar situation, there's always a feeling of, um, hesitancy and not really fear, but just kind of, you know, awkwardness. Right. Uh, but right away, a, a lady started talking to me and she asked me, you know, um, she took me to where they were selling the food and, and, and I didn't have cash. I just, I just, it was, it was the, um, it was the day after I think, or the, or two days after Anthony Bourdain was found. Um, I just needed to know that they were still there. Ah. I just needed to know that I could still go there. And so I didn't have cash. <laughs> I, I went and, and I was supposed to be somewhere else. Um, I didn't have money and, and I told um, the lady, I said, you know, I didn't, and bring, I didn't bring my cash, but I would like to come back. She was going to buy me a shaved ice. Oh my goodness. So you just have to go with, uh, people can sense if you have an open attitude and, and, and a genuine intentions. And, uh, and the goodness in people. And, and, you know, people want to share their culture and people want to share, you know, um, their food and their stories. And, yes. and you think that they don't, but they do. They do. It's, it's something I think that is in all of us. We all yeah. want to be able to share our story. Yeah. Well, I want to redirect. So one yeah. of the things that I do on the podcast with everyone is I pull an animal spirit card. Would you like Ooh. an animal spirit card? Sure. So the reason why I do this is because... In some ways, I think it's a fun game. Mm -hmm. And in other ways, I feel like 
we're guided towards what we need to see. And then in another way, I think it's a really great lens to wherever it is that we are in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so this deck is divided up into four suits, five suits, mm -hmm. earth, fire, wind, water, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Spirit cards sometimes get, get pulled. And if, we, if they do get pulled, those are typically creatures not of this earth. Oh. <laughs> so, so if you could put your hands on the deck, maybe close your okay. eyes and just okay. take a couple big breaths. And whenever you're ready, just cut the deck with your left hand. Okay, do I open my eyes? You can, okay. yes. Okay, and when you say cut the deck, you mean separate? Yeah, take, take, just separate, open. yeah. Okay. And then flip this one over. Ooh, the dolphin. So the dolphin is a creature of the water, and the water element represents our emotional life and our creative spirit, so to speak. Ooh. It is... I'm going to read you what the dolphin says. Oh. Um, let's see. Innately intelligent, healer, light, blessings. The gift of the dolphin are beyond what our human minds can grasp. Dolphin personalities are often drawn to the healing arts as they are sensitive to the subtle and enjoy working on the level of spirit. It's easy for dolphin types to underestimate the impact they make in the world. These creatures play such an important role in the wheel of karma that coming in contact with the dolphin type will change the entire course of your day and thus your life. This card can also indicate a profound blessing is on the way. When in balance, active healer, strong spiritual practice. When out of balance, underestimates own power to bring into balance like-minded spirits. Mm, How does that nice. land for you? Wow. Um, you know, I feel like that's pretty spot on. At first I was thinking dolphin. I am not a swimmer at all <laughs> and not at all comfortable in the water. Um, but I like what it said about just, um, you know, the spirit and, and, and being spiritual. It's something that I always crave mm -hmm. to be um, connected to. And um, when I am busy and stressed, <laughs> which sometimes I am quite frequently these days, um, I always, I always um, want that spiritual center again. I always um, am looking for ways to regain that, to reconnect to that, yes. to that sense of strength and, and, and calming energy and, and being able to pay attention to what's going on around you. Yes. and appreciate, which is very strange because I, I, I think I come off as an A personality, as someone who's always da -da 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 -da. but I yearn to be someone who is more in the moment and mm. who is um, always seeking a higher level of, of, um, of whatever is before me or, or, or a higher level of whatever I'm working on right. or toward. Yes. Oh. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> How long were you a reporter at the News and Record? So I was there. I started in 98. And then I left when my son was two um, to focus more on. I was just enchanted with him. And, um, and then my mother-in-law at the time was, was um, failing in health. And we knew that she was going to need more attention. And so I left. Um, for a couple of years, and then the magazine editor opportunity, um, the opportunity I got the opportunity to start a magazine, and it was just too good to pass up. <laughs> so it was like my dream job. Um, so I went back. So all total, it was um, it was uh, eighteen years ish. Yeah. And how long did you work on eighteen oh eight? It was about um, probably two years I think I was going I, we finished our full second year and getting ready to start the third yeah that's so cool yeah and so now could you tell our listeners what you're up to now so now I um, work for public schools I work for Guilford County Schools and um, 
uh, as a media relations specialist. I help um, the media um, when they want to come visit a school and, and tell stories. And um, so, yeah, I write a lot of press releases. I write a lot of um, uh, talking points and speeches. And um, sometimes I get to write stories. And that's when I really feel happiest. <laughs> right. I can imagine. Yeah. In life or in work, what's a project you're really excited to be working on right now? Oh, gosh. Um, or maybe one you want to be working on. <laughs> one, what I really want to do is um, I really, I really, you know, I really miss the storytelling and I really miss the creative, um, the creativity, the creative process that mm -hmm. I had with the magazine of working with other creative people who are talented photographers or designers to, you know, their strength and, and their I and their expertise um, with with what I could bring to the table and together we could create a really nice package or presentation of something I miss that um, what I'd really like to do is find some kind of vehicle avenue to, to do that again whether it's um, through a blog or you know something um, online or in some form. I've, I've been thinking about it. Um, my, my current job responsibilities are quite demanding. The mm -hmm. hours are quite long and um, the work can be stressful. Um, so, And then when I'm not working, I, I honestly I just want to be with my family. And um, so, you know, when I would have time for that is, is something that I'm going to have to figure out. Um, I don't want it to be um, a stressful thing because you know, once it's it, you put a lot of pressure on yourself to, to, to produce something and and you feel like it's in a hurry and and you're not really doing the best work and, and I don't I wouldn't want it to become that but um, but I'm thinking about a, some kind of creative project probably um, because I love food and 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 um, just the the stories that you can tell around food um, so much it would probably be something um, food and culture related um. that sounds really exciting <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of people that would love to hear that <laughs> whatever yeah. that ends up being so I put it out there so now I have to follow through <laughs> <laughs> you know in the work that I do as a coach, so much of it is encouraging people to say out loud what they want to do and then maybe even putting pen to paper yeah. and putting some buy when dates out there, which I won't make you do right now. Um, but you know, you can yeah. have that in the back of your head. Yeah. Buy when would I want to do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you could go back and sit down the high school version of Tina or the college version of Tina. <laughs> What would you tell her? Uh, I would tell her not to be afraid to be herself. You know, I um, I grew up, um, you know, frankly, with a lot of trauma. You know, I mean, I, I, I say trauma. I, I, I know of things that happen to kids today that um, don't even come close to what, what happened to me. Um, but my, my parents just, I was going through a lot at home. And my parents... Um, you know, their their marriage was not what it needed to be. And frankly, they didn't need to be parents. Um, but it was what it was. And, um, you know, I grew up um, just not feeling, ever wanting to be at home. I would feel knots in my stomach um, as soon as that bell rang. Um, I hated... Um, holidays and I hated weekends I hated snow days um, you know as soon as I was old enough to work I would work as much as I could and if um, my jobs had been open on Christmas I would have worked on Christmas and but I nobody would have known that um, my, my, my closest friends knew that but I hit it and I hit it so well I, I became I took on this persona of of being incredibly ditzy and flighty and um, mm. just, um, you know, like I didn't have any cares or I didn't have any. Um, I was a very different person from what I was inside and at home. And um, and some of that, it, it, it was a little less so in college because I had more control of my life right. and I had more control of my surroundings. and and um, 
but I still had a little bit of, I realized that people didn't, people my age at that time um, didn't, want, didn't want to be around a downer. <laughs> You know, I didn't feel like I could really be my true self. And, and I think if I had to talk, tell, talk to myself, I, I would say um, to don't, not be afraid to show who you are. And don't be afraid to show um, what you're struggling with and, and, um, and the pain that you feel and the, and the, you know, the hopes that you have. And, um, and there are other people who are going through the same thing. And, um, you know, I feel like, especially in high school, that person that I was shaped what other people thought of me. And it was very, a very inaccurate picture of who I was. Mm. And, um, and you don't realize it at the time how much that can impact, you know, where you end up or what opportunities are presented to you, right. um, how people can help you or not help you. Um, and it was a long time before I realized that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Is there a motto or piece of advice that you try to live by? Mm. I have to keep telling myself that um, because I, 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 I'm a highly anxious person mm. <laughs> and I I try to keep it together on the outside but inside I might be incredibly just um, freaking out <laughs> and I think that's um, a really normal feeling <laughs> yeah and I, I feel it frequently I mean not at home you know that's not like my safe place but um, but just you know um, maybe at work or, or in, out there in the world um, or if something is happening you know while I'm out you know at the store um, whatever that is that's happening at that moment I try to remind myself that it's only temporary and it's going to pass and a month from now it's not going to have the same intensity and the same meaning and the same whatever um, it's not going to be worth keeping even right. you know a month or a week or even maybe hours <laughs> later yes and um you know or if i lose something you know okay you lost it and that's that's um, very sad that you did but what did you really lose you know think about the other things that would be so much more devastating you know um you know, my, my kid doesn't do something that I ask him to do. Well, in the grand scheme of things, it really doesn't matter if he put his socks in the hamper right when I asked him to do it. <laughs> He's doing what kids are supposed to do, and that's not listening sometimes, yeah. right? Is it worth me really, you know, going ballistic over now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, your job is to be creative. Mm -hmm. And your job has always been to be creative. So what... What keeps you going? What keeps you creating when you maybe don't feel like it? Um, so it, it took a while for me to, um, to acknowledge and to, to describe myself or, or feel that I was creative, actually. Um, because my husband is an incredibly amazing artist. Mm -hmm. And he is, has been, um, you know, his mother says when he was three, he started drawing three-dimensionally. I mean, you know, he's, he's that gifted. Um, and I have friends who are gifted in that way visually. And um, so I've always kind of felt um, through my adult life that, you know, they were the creative ones. But um, I think they're different. I've come to realize there are different levels and different ways to be creative. And, um, and I find myself, you know, in the days and the times when I don't feel like I'm able to be creative in the way that I want to, you know, just going for a walk and um, paying attention to the way the light comes in through the trees and the way the clouds are forming and how blue the sky is or um, looking at the nature around me or and sometimes taking a picture, sometimes not, or, you know, cutting flowers from my yard and putting them in 
faces around it's my one house. Of my favorite things to do. <laughs> yeah, it's just you know there are ways to if you are a creative person or if you are a person who pre appreciates creativity, I think you always find time and ways to express that, even if it's not in the way that you want to at the moment. <laughs> yes, I I agree with that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I am curious, like, what your current dream is. Oh, gosh. Um, I I would love to one day be able to. I, I meet with a group of writers. They let me crush their, you know, these. I meet with a group of people who have actually published novels and, and poetry, books of poetry, and, and they teach creative writing. And, and I would love to, um, you know, I fast forward, and I think when, you know, our, hopefully our place in the mountains is built, and... Um, I go back to being able to, you know, spend more time on my craft. I would love to be able to, to, to really write more. You are working time. on a book, aren't you? Well, I mean, in my head. <laughs> in my head. I have stories all the time, just kind of, you know, that float in and out of my head. I live in, I, I'm a big daydreamer. And you know, like I wake up much. I wake up much earlier than when I actually get out of bed. And a lot of times, it's because I'm just lying there daydreaming, or um, I just walk around and I daydream. <laughs> and so, and that daydreaming is useful. That's, that's where <laughs> stories come from. Yeah, yeah. So I think you know, I have these little vignettes playing in my head, and I don't know. Some someday, but you know, um, people think that um, I will say this. People think that because I was a journalist and I wrote for newspapers for so many years, that the other piece of writing it, is not difficult. But I actually, um, when I was a feature writer, I was my boss was great, and she allowed me to alter my schedule so that I could have one day off a week, and and that was going to be when I was going to do my own project. And um, it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was because, you know, I'm writing, as a journalist, I'm writing other people's stories. Other people are supplying me with these great quotes and these, you know, these things that really happen. And when you're, you know, left to kind of recreate or create it or whatever, and, you know, independently, there's a, a real gift in doing that without it sounding forced or, you know, um, to be able to convey that in a very genuine and authentic yes. way. There's a gift in that. And um, and it, it, it takes work and it would take work. And so I don't take for granted that, you know, one day if I'm able to transition to, to doing more writing that it would be easy or that, um, that it will be good, <laughs> frankly. But Elizabeth Gilbert says that it's not our... It's not any of our business whether or not that work is good. Our, our business is to just put it out there. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. It, she's got lots of wise words around creativity. <laughs> awesome. Her book, Big Magic, is really, oh, awesome. it's really good. If you haven't read it, I would yeah. check it out. Um, yeah. But I would just encourage you to, to do that work. Cool. Don't wait for someday. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank Just in you. case you need an extra push, I'm gonna yes. I'm gonna push. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite yoga pose? Do you practice yoga? I don't even know. I, yeah. Well, I I did quite actively before I um, before my work demands and family demands and and that's one thing I really really miss a lot. I used to be way more physically active. Um, and frankly, when I work really long hours, my choice when I get home, if I'm still have energy is um, not to exercise, unfortunately. My, my choice is to spend that time being with my son and listening to him tell me what he did in the d his day or to look at the bugs that he wants to show me. Or, you know, um, I know that I'm not going to have this time forever with him. And so I figure, you know, this is just the season of my life right now. But I do miss um, yoga. And um, my favorite yoga pose, um, I know what my least favorite is. What's your least favorite? <laughs> that's a good, that's fun too. Lots of people think I'm crazy, but it's the corpse pose. <laughs> I get very Shavasana. stressed. I get very stressed out because my mind is going like what I need to do next, what I should have done. Like instead of being, I, I struggle with being in the moment always, yeah. even though, even though that's something that I desperately want. Tina, that's so normal. I don't know, as a yoga teacher, someone who taught for a number of years, mm -hmm. um, 
There was actually someone in town who opened a yoga studio. It was one of my favorite yoga studios. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, But, and it was the first place that I considered a yoga home. She told me Mm -hmm. a story that when she first started practicing yoga, she would make sure to leave right before Shavasana because she couldn't handle sitting. (laughs) And she eventually (laughs) practiced to a point where she was Mm -hmm. able to... Mm -hmm. um, be in shavasana but that's yeah. normal that's yeah. totally normal yeah yeah i i just i feel anxious and i'm thinking well how much longer and if i even though my eyes are closed if i see like lights or movement i you know yeah it takes you out of that moment. yeah and yeah. for those who are listening that might not know what shavasana is but it's at the end of yoga class you lay there for it depends on where you go sometimes it's a minute some places in my classes it's almost always 10 minutes Oh, I know it would be really hard. Um, so some people love it, some people don't. And what I would always tell people is it's the most important pose of all of yoga because mm-hmm. oftentimes it's the only time all day that you just get to be with yourself. Yes, yes, and and I do um, see the value in it, and I do. I'm I'm always flirting with the idea of meditation, and yes. because I feel like that would be so helpful for me. Um, but it's so hard to do. Wow. <laughs> There's yeah. enough of an A personality in me that, that really finds that difficult. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's completely normal. <laughs> um, how do you live a life of abundance? Uh, for me, it's, it's being appreciative of, um, of what I have. Yes. You know, it's so easy to think, oh, if I just, you know, I, I want to get this, or our family needs this, or, you know, I wish I had this, but but for me, if I think about what we do have, and um, and just, just being, you know, just being a mom is an opportunity that I never thought that I wanted. It was, it was not anything that I, I, I just didn't think I'd ever be a parent or that I wanted to be a parent and um but it has brought so much richness to my life and just um being with my family and being with friends who um bring a lot to my have I'm really fortunate to have really um a pretty diverse um, network of friends um who I can say I feel like they genuinely care about me and 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 my growth as a person and as a as a you know writer or mom or you know friend yes um and i feel like i have a very abundant life when i think about the people who are around me and um and even just being in my house i feel (laughs) you know just that sense of calm and peace I hope you were inspired by Tina's words of wisdom. If you've enjoyed this podcast, head over to iTunes, give us a review, and then remember, sharing is caring. So please, share this podcast with a friend. Who do you know that could use a dose of inspiration and wisdom? When you share this podcast, it makes it possible for us to keep bringing wise words your way. Check out our website, yokeandabundance.com, for more words of wisdom, creativity tips, and information about my group and individual coaching programs. If you're looking to cultivate your creativity, this is the last week to get in on the early bird special for our Cultivating Creativity Seaside Retreat in Beaufort, North Carolina at the end of October. Head over to the website, yokeandabundance.com, for more information. A huge thank you to our sponsor, Emerge Skin Therapy, and my wonderful editor and producer, Ira Sterling at Julia Sound Recordings. Remember, every one of us has wisdom within. Keep sharing your words of wisdom because you never know who you'll inspire.